that um, to mute the speakers and please be advised to turn on the video with RCP background provided through the email. And we also inform, announce that this uh, web seminar is uh, has a simultaneous translations English to Spanish and Spanish to English, where you have to uh, press the button on your screen in the middle, I think. And uh, for all questions will be done uh, only in the chat room. So let us begin. So I now give the floor to Mr. Ignacio Bartesagi from the University of the Catholic University of Uruguay. Please, Mr. Ignacio. Thanks, Rudy. Good morning and welcome to the webinar about the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Opportunities Ahead. First, I want to thank the Embassy of Indonesia in Argentina and especially to the Ambassador Ninik Kun Nariati for the invitation to moderate this important event. In my opinion, it's, a, it's the perfect moment to discuss about this topic. So congratulations to all the team of the Embassy and the ASEAN Committee in Buenos Aires. I also want to thank to our keynote speakers that will be the Ambassador Kun Nariati, the Ambassador Carola Ramon Berjano, and Anna Roveniol. Then we're going to have, as Rudy said, a space for some comments about the presentations and some questions. I want to remember that to all the participants again, that the webinar has simultaneous translation to Spanish or to English. You only must choose your language in the bottom of your screen. Now I will switch to Spanish to read very briefly the CVs of our panelists. And after a very short comment about the agreement, I will give the floor to Ambassador Ninik. Brevemente quiero recordarles el currículum de Ninik Kunnariati, que es actualmente la embajadora de Indonesia en Argentina, concurrente ante Uruguay y Paraguay. Ninik ha ocupado diversos cargos dentro del Ministerio de Relaciones Exteriores de Indonesia, además de cumplir funciones en Estados Unidos e India. Fue embajadora de Indonesia en Ucrania, por lo que cuenta con una vasta experiencia en diferentes continentes. Se graduó en Comunicaciones en la Universidad de Indonesia y, entre otros temas, está especializada en migración. Por otro lado, Carola Ramón Berjano es actualmente subsecretaria de Negociaciones Económicas Multilaterales y Bilaterales del Ministerio de Relaciones Exteriores, Comercio Internacional y Culto de Argentina. Carola tiene mucha experiencia internacional, vivió en Londres y en Hong Kong, habla fluidamente varios idiomas. Integra el CARI, que como saben es uno de los think tanks más prestigiosos de América Latina, es PhD y Máster en Economía Latinoamericana e Integración, regional de la Universidad de Londres, Máster en Economía de la Universidad SEMA y licenciada en Economía de la USAL. También ha realizado cursos cortos de especialización en Bélgica, China e Inglaterra. Ana Roveniol, que tendrá a su cargo la presentación principal, es la directora de Integración de Mercados de la Secretaría de la SEA, que tiene su sede en Yakarta, Indonesia. Dirigió la División de Relaciones Económicas Externas de la SEA. Antes de ingresar a la Secretaría, ocupó cargos en el Ministerio de Comercio e Industria de Filipinas y fue jefa negociadora, nada más y nada menos que del RCEP, además de otros tratados de libre comercio negociados por su país. Ana cuenta con una amplia experiencia en política comercial y negociaciones, tiene un grado en Economía por la Universidad Santo Tomás de Manila, posgrado en Relaciones Internacionales y Desarrollo, un máster en Management de la Universidad Nacional de Singapur y de la Harvard University en Cambridge. Por último... Nuestros comentaristas, como dijo Rudy, van a ser Mariana Polisi, que ya los presentó, Mohamed Nasir Mohamed Nor y Rodolfo Cafaro Kramer. Con Rodolfo quiero comentar adicionalmente que, eh, que es como saben el presidente de la Cámara Mercosur ASEAN, inauguramos ya hace varios años una cátedra sobre Mercosur ASEAN junto con la Universidad Católica, la UAD de la Universidad Católica de Uruguay, la UAD de Argentina, la Universidad Pelita Jalapán de Indonesia y la Universidad Nacional de Malasia, con la cual realizamos actividades regulares. También eh, quiero agradecer que lo vi por allí, la presencia del cónsul honorario de Indonesia en Uruguay, Nicolás Potri, a todo su equipo, que realizan un trabajo muy importante en el país. Antes de darle paso eh, a la embajadora Ninik, algunos comentarios generales sobre el RCEP. Sin lugar a dudas se trata del mayor acuerdo comercial del mundo, Ana nos va a hablar de eso, incluso sin India, que como saben, eh, por el momento no se integró al acuerdo. El mismo ya fue incorporado por China, por Singapur y por Japón y está en camino de ser aprobado por otros miembros de la SEA, por lo que sin duda este acuerdo se va a transformar en una realidad. Es un instrumento que termina de confirmar 
el rol que la ASEAN está jugando en el comercio internacional y en las cadenas globales de valor. Por lo tanto, es el epicentro del RCEP. Además, a través del RCEP se, firmado, se firmó un acuerdo entre China, Japón y Corea del Sur, nada menos. Se trata de un acuerdo profundo que no solo incorpora bienes, que fue negociado con mucho pragmatismo, lo que implicó aceptar las diferencias entre sus miembros para alcanzar, alcanzar la cohesión necesaria para poder cerrarlo. De cierta forma diría que el espíritu de Asian Way está muy presente en el RCEP. Se dice que el liderazgo del acuerdo fue de China, especialmente por la competencia que en su momento se generó con el TPP liderado por Estados Unidos, hoy CPTPP, llamado también TPP-11, pero lo cierto es que la ASEAN es la clave del RCEP por el impulso que muestran sus, dinamismo, sus, in, sus miembros, pero también por el propio dinamismo y las propias transformaciones de su principal potencia, Indonesia, la que sin lugar a dudas se va a transformar en un actor de peso global en los próximos años. No me voy a detener en los números del acuerdo, me refiero a lo que implica en términos de, de PBI, de población, de comercio mundial, de inversiones, porque eso lo va a tratar seguramente Ana, sino en cómo está reaccionando América Latina frente a este suceso y a la incidencia que va a tener este acuerdo en los flujos comerciales del Mercosur. Solemos pensar que el impacto del RCEP estará acotado a las mejoras de acceso que van a obtener Australia y Nueva Zelanda en la exportación de alimentos hacia los integrantes de este acuerdo. Pero nos olvidamos que la propia ASEAN, China, Japón y Corea del Sur, ya son productores de alimentos que van a seguir compitiendo ahora mucho más con nosotros en esta región y también en el comercio de servicios. Para la región la importancia de la RCEP es evidente. Tomando el ejemplo de Uruguay, solo algún dato. Las exportaciones de los, a los miembros del RCEP pasaron de 135 millones de dólares en el año 99 a 1.726 millones en el 2020, lo que supone un crecimiento de 1.192%. Las exportaciones crecieron el doble que las importaciones hacia, con esta región. China es el principal socio, es verdad, del RCEP, explicando el 90% de las exportaciones, pero le siguen Tailandia y Vietnam, que además cuando calculamos la variación, mercados como Vietnam muestran incluso mayor dinamismo para Uruguay que lo que muestran China. No tengo duda entonces que a través de una profundización de las relaciones con la SEAN, los miembros del Mercosur tienen oportunidades de diversificar sus exportaciones externas en bienes y en servicios. Pero para eso debemos comprender la dinámica de este mega acuerdo y debemos intentar reaccionar para no perder espacio en el comercio global. Y para eso este seminario cae en el momento justo. Así que por aquí me quedo, embajador Aninik. Thank you again, and the floor is yours. Ambassador Aninik, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Your Excellency, Ambassador Carola Ramon Berjamo, and the Secretary for Bilateral, Multilateral Economic Negotiation, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Argentina, Ms. Ana Rubinio, Director for Market Integration of ASEAN Secretariat, as our presenter for today's webinar, and Professor Ignacio Bartesagi from Universidad Católica del Uruguay, as our moderator. Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to all of you. I would like first to thank you all for joining us here at the webinar Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership or RCEP, Opportunity Ahead. This webinar is part of ACBA's activities in promoting ASEAN in the third country. The member of ACBA, the member of ACBA is actually uh, uh, embassies in Buenos Aires, that is uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam. SCBA contribute disseminate the importance of ASEAN, specifically in Argentina, uh, by various activities. I also would like to, to say that when SCBA received by Foreign Minister Sola last March, He mentioned how important ASEAN is for Argentina's strategy of integration in the region through Mercosur and highlighted the interest in intensifying and satisfying trade with its member states. 
fostering investment and promoting cooperation on high technology. That is why our webinar today focus on our set opportunities ahead. After initiated 10 years ago and after a long process of negotiation, RCEP is finally signed on the December, November 15, I'm sorry, 2020. It is an important milestone and amid the increase of mistrust and tension between major powers and the gloomy world's economy due to the pandemic. RCEP as a victory over the principle of multilateralism because it affirms the principle of open, fair, and beneficial trade for all. Most importantly, RCEP provides hope and optimism for the post-pandemic economic recovery. And last but not least, last, uh, like moderator has been said, RCEP is also an important part of the regional commitment toward ASEAN centrality in the Indo-Pacific. Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, signed by 10 ASEAN member states and five countries in the Asia Pacific, namely Australia, China, Japan, New Zealand, and South Korea, ASEAN provides you with market access to one third of the global economy and two billion consumers, including the 600 million population of ASEAN. According to data, export to RCEP countries account for 20% of Argentina's total export between 2016-2018. Argentina agro-industry export to RCEP are even larger, accounting 20% of the country export and 36% in 2019 itself. We hope that this number can further increase with more Argentinian businesses doing its business in ASEAN countries. Today, we are grateful that Ms. Anna Rubinio, the Director for Market Integration of the ASEAN Secretariat is here with us. I'm sure that her experience in the RCEP negotiation process will give, give you first-hand information and provide you with better understanding of the RCEP. Before I conclude, allow me to take this opportunity again to thank Her Excellency Ambassador Bergamo for your present and invaluable remarks on today's event. Also to my ASEAN Head of Mission who are around the uh, screen right now and staff in Buenos Aires for all the hard work and cooperation. And also to Foreign Ministry of Argentina the Foreign Ministry of Uruguay and Paraguay through its embassy in Buenos Aires, the Chamber of Commerce, think tanks, universities, and media in helping us disseminate information of this webinar and in supporting and ensuring its success. I would also like to personally thank our moderator today, Professor Bart Asante. I wish you all a fruitful discussion in this webinar. Thank you. Terima kasih. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Ambassador, for your words. Now I will give the floor to Carola Ramon Berjano. Uh, Carola, it's nice to see you again. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador, uh, for your kind remarks. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you all. Nice to see you, Ignacio, again. Uh, nice to, to see so many friendly and friends uh, and colleagues uh, here. I see it's about 100 participants today, so it's a real pleasure to to be with you today. Um, if I may, I'm going to continue in, in Spanish. I believe there's, there's a, a translation, so I will be continuing in, in Spanish. Es que, bueno, muchísimas gracias, eh, embajadora, este, su excelencia, por, por invitarme a, a participar hoy y hacer estas, estas palabras de, de apertura de este seminario que es, que es tan importante. La, la firma el, el año pasado, en noviembre del año pasado de, del RECEP, eh, como dijo usted, es un, es un milestone, ¿no? es, una, es, un, es un momento muy importante porque, por varios motivos. En, en primer lugar, porque muestra que en, en los últimos años que tanto se ha hablado de, de, de si el multilateralismo estaba en crisis o no estaba en crisis, creo que viene a afirmar que el multilateralismo no está en crisis. Este compromiso de, de la región eh, con el multilateralismo y el libre comercio realmente es una señal muy importante para, para el resto del mundo. Por otro lado, también que se haya firmado en un contexto de pandemia como, como el que estamos viviendo, también es una señal 
sumamente importante, no solamente de que necesitamos afianzar los lazos de, de cooperación eh, y de que la cooperación en Asia sigue funcionando, sino que también en los esfuerzos que nos va a llevar a todos para el periodo post-pandémico y la recuperación, que va a ser muy importante. Entonces creo que por esos dos eh, puntos es muy importante, más allá del, del, del acuerdo en sí, que como eh, decían ustedes, bueno, es el 30% de la población mundial, 30% del comercio y 30% del PBI mundial. ¿no? Más allá de eso, creo que la firma se ha dado en un momento muy significativo para todo el mundo. Eh, también Ignacio mencionaba esto de que muchas veces se, se habla del rol de China o el rol de la ASEAN. Yo siempre digo que el RECEP es ASEAN-céntrico. Eh, creo que lo, lo destacable justamente de este acuerdo es el rol importantísimo que ha tenido eh, la comunidad ASEAN en, en este acuerdo. Y creo que también en, en este acuerdo se puede ver la importancia y los valores principales que ha tenido la ASEAN en todas estas décadas desde su fundación, ¿no? y es los valores de cooperación, integración, a pesar de las diferencias entre los países, las diferencias de tamaños, de PBI, culturales, políticas, muchas diferencias, y sin embargo, y a pesar de todas ellas, la cooperación y la integración entre los países ha continuado. Creo que eso es un valor muy importante y creo que eso se deja ver en, en el acuerdo del, del RECEP en general, por eso a mí me gusta decir que es ASEAN eh, céntrico. Eh, por otra parte, en cuanto a nuestro país, si bien no tenemos acuerdos de libre comercio con, con ninguno de los países del, del RECEP, pero sí eh, los países son muy importantes dentro de nuestro comercio internacional, son algunos de nuestros socios eh, más importantes. Y como, como todos sabemos, el, el dinamismo del crecimiento en toda la región del Asia-Pacífico es una, eh, una gran oportunidad para, para nuestro país y nuestros países del, del Mercosur. ¿no? El, el, cre las crecientes tasas de urbanización, la creciente eh, importancia de, de la clase media en toda la región del, del Asia-Pacífico, que lo hemos visto en las últimas décadas, pero que son procesos continuos que van a seguir este, marcando eh, las tendencias de producción, de consumo, de integración de cadenas globales de valor en las próximas décadas, eh, es muy importante para nuestra región. Creo por ese lado que, por un lado, nos va a presentar eh, muchas oportunidades, que va a haber que, que, que seguir evaluando. Las venimos, algunos de los que veo acá, las caras que vemos acá, las venimos evaluando y venimos hablando de estas oportunidades hace muchos años. Eh, hay aquí grandes expertos este, con nosotros, creo que va a haber que seguir evaluando esas oportunidades. También nos presenta desafíos, porque una mayor integración entre los países del RECEP hace que bueno, también tengamos países eh, que son consumidores y a la vez competidores nuestros. Eh, hoy día en los países que integran el RECEP, eh, más o menos el, el 30% de las importaciones agrícolas provienen de la Argentina, este, ahí tenemos grandes oportunidades, creo que hay que seguir trabajando sobre las aperturas de mercado, sobre la promoción, entender un poco cómo son estas tendencias en, en, en esta región. Eh, y bueno, sin, eh, sin mucho más para agregar que eh, nuevamente decir que creo que esto es un... un una señal muy importante, la firma el año pasado de este acuerdo, como les decía, creo que es un momento muy especial, y también nos interpela en nuestra región, a la Argentina como país y a nuestra región, en repensar eh, los procesos de, de integración, de integración al mundo y de integración regional eh, nuestros también. Así que bueno, eh, muchísimas gracias por, por la invitación a, a hacer esta apertura, y... Ahora escuchar sí a Ana Rosiñol, que, que es la gran experta y nos va a hablar en, en, en detalle de, de este acuerdo. Así que muchísimas gracias a todos. Muchas gracias, Carola, por tu comentario y tu apertura. Rudy, I think that now we have a time, some time for a picture before going to with Ana. That's true. Yes, Ignacio. Yes. Okay. Uh, so we'll have a, a break to take uh, pictures of, of of all of us. So we ask uh, to all of us to turn on the video, please. Uh, Mr. Raji, whenever you, whenever you want, we can take the picture now. Uh, 
Tá me dando? Esse é o que, Mr. G? Okay, uh, Miss uh, Miss Adi just told me that well, we still have to pose in front of the camera. <laughs> so, all right. All right, so uh, I'll give you back the floor, Mr. Ignacio. Okay, thank you, Rudy. Now okay, it's time from, I give the floor to Anna Rovignol to give the central presentation and the views about uh, the agreement. Anna, it's a pleasure to, to have you with us. Your time, please. Welcome. Okay. Uh, muchas gracias, uh, Professor Ignacio Batesagi. Uh, excellencies, uh, uh, Ibuninik kun uh, Nariate, uh, Excellency uh, Ambassador uh, Carola Ramon Berhano. Uh, first of all, I, I would like to thank you all for uh, taking interest to know more about the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, the organizers uh, of this forum, the Comité de ASEAN uh, and a uh, Buenos Aires uh, for giving us the opportunity to actually uh, share with uh, everyone our thoughts and insights uh, on RCEP, which is actually uh, the a mega regional agreement uh, that we are all proud of, especially for us and the ASEAN Secretariat, because we were able uh, to conclude the negotiations for this agreement at the time uh, when the world is uh, facing uh, the COVID-19 uh, the pa pandemic. Uh, I would not uh, take long uh, in my, I would try to make my presentation as short as possible, but do feel free uh, to, th that is to allow more time for everyone at the Q&A, but do, do feel free to interrupt me anytime uh, should you need any clarification on uh, whatever I'm saying. So if I can ask my colleague uh, who's somewhere in Jakarta uh, to flash, uh, to share our slides. Uh, so basically uh, for those who are uh, not familiar with ASEAN, I, I mean, I, I think uh, maybe Fendi, can we go to the first slide please? The outline of the presentation. Uh, yeah. So my presentation will basically cover four points. Uh, the first one is a brief introduction to ASEAN. And then we will go to uh, the overview of uh, the RCEP, uh, including the negotiations and what RCEP is all about. And then uh, we would go into RCEP and ASEAN and perhaps what it means uh, to ASEAN-Argentina trade relations. And then we will conclude uh, thereafter. So for the next slide, please. Uh, so basically ASEAN comprises 10 uh, member states Brunei, Cambodia, Indonesia, Lao, PDR, Malaysia, Myanmar, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam. I'm not sure if all 10 uh, member states are represented in Buenos Aires, uh, but nonetheless, I think well, whichever member states, I, I think five of them or six are in Buenos Aires, they would aptly uh, represent uh, ASEAN uh, as a region. Uh, taken as a single entity, uh, we have 656. Uh, I mean, in terms of population in ASEAN, and they are mostly young people, 72.1 uh, years is the average life expectancy of people in, in this region. Uh, the real GDP growth is at 4.6, which is higher than the world average, uh, and a GDP per capita, which is 4,827.4 uh us dollars makes asean as the fifth largest economy in, in the world our top export markets are china japan us hong kong and korea asean has ftas with all five except the us and our top import suppliers are china japan 
uh, the US, Hong Kong, and Korea. I mean, similar to exports, we the only FTA that we we don't have is with the US. Our top investors are ASEAN, EU, Japan, China, uh, India, and uh, are okay. Uh, we don't have FTAs with the uh, European Union. We have a bilateral FTA with India. As for the top sectors, uh, we cover uh, financial services, uh, wholesale and retail, as well as uh, manufacturing. Next slide, please. So uh, the, the slide that you see in the screen basically uh, shows the, the network of ASEAN FTAs. And as you would see, uh, it is important to understand this because you would learn later that one of the reasons why we went into uh, RCEP uh, is basically to consolidate the, the at the time, uh, five uh, bilateral uh, FTAs between ASEAN and uh, the FTA partners that we have in the region. So we have six now. Uh, the first one that we had was with China, followed by Korea, then uh, Japan, then India, and we have one FTA together with uh, Australia and uh, New Zealand. Our most recent FTA uh, that entered into for some time last year uh, is with uh, Hong Kong, uh, China. Next slide, please. So the next uh, set of slides will give you an overview of uh, RCEP. Next slide, please. So the genesis, we keep on hearing that, I mean, you would read uh, in, in most uh, academic papers and even press releases that uh, the, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement uh, took eight years to negotiate, but in fact, uh, work on the on uh, RCEP even went before that. I mentioned earlier that we the, the five FTAs that we had, and in 2009 there was a, this a proposal that I think emanated from Korea to do an RCEP. Uh, I mean to do an uh, EAFTA, which is the East Asia Free Trade Area, comprising the 10 ASEAN member states plus Japan, China, and Korea. But then after uh, subsequently, uh, we completed negotiations with India, as well as with Australia and New Zealand, which prompted uh, Japan to counter propose that perhaps it would be better uh, if the FTA, I mean, if consolidation of the ASEAN plus one FTAs be done through the comprehensive economic partnership uh, in East Asia. So, we call this the plus three plus plus six uh, debate. So ASEAN was caught in the middle of the plus three and plus six debate. So eventually to get out of uh, the situation that ASEAN was in, in 2011, uh, during uh, Indonesia's uh, chairmanship, it was decided that ASEAN will come up with a set of guidelines uh, to uh, see how co the consolidation of the FTAs will uh, be worked out. Uh, so in 2011, there was this ASEAN framework for a regional comprehensive economic partnership. In fact, the term regional economic, uh, economic partnership was a term uh, coined by uh, then minister Marie Pangestu. Uh, prior to that, we were calling the RCEP agreement as just ASEAN plus plus because the agreement or the understanding was we ASEAN will come up with a set of guidelines. We, do, we won't call it plus three or plus six, that whoever, whichever of ASEAN's FTA partners at that time uh, are ready to join the negotiations, then that will be the plus. So we were calling it ASEAN plus plus until uh, it was uh, the, the term or the name Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership was coined. So in 2012, uh, be, uh, between 2011, from the signing of the framework up to 2012, ASEAN together with the six FTA partners worked on a set of guiding principles and objectives for negotiating the RCEP. But even uh, having negotiated that piece of document uh, by 16 countries, 
uh, even at the last minute, we were not sure whether all 16 of them would actually join the launch of the negotiations. But uh, fortunately, uh, RCEP negotiations was launched during the Cambodian chairmanship in 2012. And then in 2020, after eight rounds, I mean, not really eight rounds, after eight years uh, of negotiations, I mean, in terms of rounds, we I think we had 30 something rounds, uh, not counting the special uh, negotiating meetings at the level, at the technical level, up to the ministerial level, uh, all in the span of eight years, we were able to conclude the negotiations and the agreement signed on 15 uh, 2020. So the signing of the RCEP agreement, even without India, has become more significant, as I mentioned earlier, as it happened at a time when the world was confronted with an unprecedented challenge caused by the COVID-19 global pandemic. Uh, negotiations actually com was completed in uh, 2019. Uh, so the, the 2020 was basically when the, the specific commitments uh, which was being undertaken at the bilateral level uh, was conducted. And most of uh, the meetings in 2020 were all done virtually. So can you just imagine the challenge brought about by this RCEP uh, to the negotiators, especially when you are coming from different uh, time zones? Uh, next slide, please. So what is RCEP? Our eight years of negotiations have yielded 14,367 pages of the agreement, comprising 20 uh, chapters, 17 annexes and 54 market access schedules. And as envisaged in the guiding uh, principles at uh, the RCEP agreement is a modern, comprehensive, high quality and a mutually beneficial uh, agreement. Uh, it hopes to open up market and employment opportunities to businesses and people in the region uh, hopefully, with uh, the opening up of markets, we would also be able to facilitate the expansion of regional trade and investment. Uh, RCEP supports an open, inclusive, and rules-based multilateral trading system. We are also hoping that RCEP would contribute to global economic growth and development, uh, especially as uh, the world gears uh, towards uh, recovery from uh, the COVID-19. Next slide, please. So I think uh, Ambassador Nini, Ibu Ninik and Ambassador uh, Barado mentioned earlier, I think even Professor uh, Basagi uh, mentioned earlier uh, that RCEP would comprise 30% of uh, the world's uh, population, uh, accounting for 30% of global GDP, 28% of uh, trade, and 19% of foreign direct investment. Once it enters into force, RCEP would be the biggest FTA in the world. Next slide, please. So what are the key features of RCEP? We would like to divide the RCEP agreement, all 20 chapters of them into three uh, broad classification. Uh, one is uh, rules and disciplines. Uh, there are the chapters on rules of origin, um, customs, procedures, and trade facilitation, uh, the special uh, sanitary and phytosanitary measures, uh, standards or TBTs, trade remedies, intellectual property, electronic commerce, micro, small, and medium enterprises, competition and consumer protection, as well as government procurement. They're all covered by uh, this category on uh, rules and disciplines. Then we have the market access category where specific commitments and uh, provisions uh, governing trade in goods, uh, trade in services, including its two annexes or three annexes on financial services, telecommunication services, uh, and professional services. Then we have a temporary movement of a natural persons or MNP, as well as investment. They all fall under this category of market access. 
And then we have Ecotech, Economic and Technical Cooperation, which basically provides the development dimension of the RCEP agreement. Uh, if you would note, uh, 10 ASEAN member states uh, are of different uh, levels of uh, development. And you bring in some more, uh, the five FTA or the six FTA partners at the time. So basically negotiating the RCEP fall under three levels of uh, development. We have uh, the developed countries, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Japan, uh, and then you have the least developed countries, Laos, Myanmar, and Cambodia, and in between are developing countries with also with different levels of uh, development from very high income uh, developing countries like uh, uh, Korea and uh, Singapore and Brunei uh, to middle uh, income developing countries such as Indonesia. Uh, Thailand, Malaysia, uh, and so on and uh, so forth. Next slide, please. So what, why are, I mean, uh, th this is uh, my, I think the next few slides would uh, somehow uh, explain why RCEP is particularly important uh, to ASEAN. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I think it's been mentioned uh, I don't know whether it's somewhere uh, later on, but uh, somehow uh, we particularly take pride in RCEP because it was a demonstration uh, of ASEAN centrality and how ASEAN, despite the divergence within uh, its membership, uh, was able to drive, to lead and drive uh, negotiations for a mega a trade deal such as uh, RCEP. But aside from that, uh, we can say that as the RCEP has Please, the microphone off. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Anna. Sorry, please. Thank you. Uh, so RCEP changed the character of ASEAN's FTA in several uh, ways. Uh, I mentioned earlier the ASEAN plus one FTAs, even at the, the FTA that we have in, in RCEP. Uh, I mean, in ASEAN, they have all always been, uh, should I say, criticized as a trade light, meaning uh, they only uh, cover trade in goods and services, investment. There is an economic cooperation chapter as well as dispute settlement. Uh, the ANZ FTA raised the bar a bit. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry, uh, raised the bar a bit because the, the ANZ FTA agreement included a chapter on uh, intellectual property uh, and competition, but they are mostly focusing on cooperation. And then the L uh, RCEP includes elements that are not in ASEAN's uh, earlier FTAs, even within ASEAN, uh, ASEAN's agenda for establishing the ASEAN Economic uh, Community. And I'm referring to uh, fairly decent chapters on intellectual property, electronic commerce, competition, as well as government procurement. Then there's also other pluses compared to ASEAN's earlier agreements. We are in RCEP, uh, some of uh, the signatory states have actually used the negative list approach uh, to scheduling specific commitments on trade in services. Uh, we have a two annex negative list for scheduling non-conforming measures, um, making RCEP the first ever agreement where ASEAN has completed a two annex negative list. None of ASEAN's plus one FTAs, not even ASEAN's internal ASEAN Comprehensive Investment Agreement has a two annex uh, negative list approach. Uh, we also have a ratchet mechanism uh, that addresses liberalization. Again, if this is not ratchet mechanism, it's not in the plus one FTAs, nor is it in uh, ASEAN. And then there is a provision for review that ensures that RCEP would be a dynamic agreement. Uh, it will remain relevant uh, and uh, it would hope to uh, keep abreast with the evolving uh, regional uh, and global uh, development. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of RCEP benefits, 
like when we go to our rules and disciplines, uh, ASEAN plus one FTAs, the, the five FTAs we had before, had actually uh, led to this perception uh, that we have this noodle bowl or this spaghetti bowl of uh, FTAs in ASEAN. We have six FTAs, uh, six or five FTAs, five different rules of origin, uh, which led to uh, probably confuse the private sector uh, in terms of trading within the region and trading with those uh, FTA partners. So in RCEP, uh, the first thing that we did was to streamline all the ROO requirements as well as the operational certification procedures that were uh, in the plus one FTA so as to achieve a single set of rules and procedures. We also uh, ensured that there is a strong uh, trade facilitation provision. Uh, some provisions in uh, RCEP even go beyond uh, what has been committed to under the WTO uh, trade facilitation agreement. Uh, rules governing uh, advanced routing, for instance, based on tariff classification, rules of origin and customs valuation are not in uh, most of the ASEAN plus one FTAs. Uh, we also try to achieve a balanced and inclusive approach to the protection and enforcement of intellectual property rights. Uh, I, I should say, I mentioned earlier that only A and Z has a, a chapter on intellectual property. In ASEAN, in its ASEAN Economic Community Blueprint, ASEAN does not have an agreement on intellectual property, and that makes the RCEP chapter on intellectual property uh, the first, uh, how should I say, it? the first agreement, uh, a substantive agreement that ASEAN member states have actually entered into, well, aside from the TRIPS agreement, but um, there are some provisions in the IP chapter of RCEP that goes even a bit beyond uh, TRIPS. And then we have uh, uh, e-commerce, uh, which includes protecting personal information of e-commerce users, location of computing facilities, cross-border transfer of information by electronic means to address uh, data-related issues. In ASEAN, we have an agreement on e-commerce. Our other ASEAN, uh, our other plus one FTAs uh, do not have an e-commerce chapter, or if ever they have, uh, it only covers, uh, again, tech economic cooperation. So again, uh, e-commerce in RCEP is the first of its kind uh, in the region. Then uh, we also make sure that the same opportunity for MSMEs to utilize uh, and benefit from the RCEP agreement. Uh, and this is provided for in a chapter uh, covering MSMEs whereby uh, it is an obligation to promote the sharing of RCEP related information that are relevant uh, to MSMEs. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of market access, now, in terms of uh, market access, uh, duty-free duty -free tariffs on at least 92% uh, of all goods within us agreed time frames uh, has been uh, committed to. Uh, by the time that the agreement enters into force, 65% uh, uh, of goods traded in the region uh, would have duty-free treatment. Uh, there is also, uh, of course, to take into account the need to also address uh, non-tariff measures. Uh, the 15 countries ensured that there will be greater transparency on the application of non-tariff measures uh, on trade in services, removal of restrictive and discriminatory measures affecting trade in services and covering all modes of supply. Uh, there is also uh, the, agree the chapter on uh, MNP, make sure to facilitate the temporary entry and stay of natural persons engage in trade or supply of services or conduct of investment. So this basically covers uh, business visitors and intra-corporate uh, trans transferees among others. Now for investment, uh, in uh, the investment chapter basically covers the four pillars of protection, liberalization, promotion, and facilitation. It includes an MFN clause, 
uh, commitments on prohibition of performance requirements that go beyond uh, the WTO uh, Trims uh, Agreement. Next slide, please. And then on Ecotech, uh, so as I, we mentioned earlier, uh, this is supposed to provide the development dimension of uh, the, the FTA. So basically through the Ecotech chapters, a technical assistance and capacity building will be provided uh, to those uh, countries who would be requiring them especially uh, the least developed uh, members in the partnership uh, to ensure that they are given equal opportunities to benefit from the agreement. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, what you see in the, on the slide is basically just a graphic presentation of how deep uh, tariff liberalization would be achieved uh, in, in RCEP. Uh, if you would look at uh, the chart, uh, the base rate or the base year that they use is actually uh, 2014, and in 2014, the average uh, uh, the average number of tariff lines uh, were MFN uh, base is a uh, MFN rate is zero, is only 27 percent, and by entry into force, this goes up to 65 percent, uh, and then by uh, it, it depends on the uh, the time frame that has been negotiated uh, bilaterally, uh, this would go up to uh, 92% when uh, the tariff facing uh, has been completed by uh, those uh, RCEP uh, parties. Next. So this one uh, only shows how, how uh, comparing uh, RCEP with the ASEAN plus one FTAs in terms of uh, uh, the level or the depth of the tariff elimination uh, that has been committed to, uh, you would see that uh, ASEAN India, we have the lowest uh, at 80% and ANZ uh, is 96%. Now you would say that uh, we, why, why didn't we go as high as what uh, we committed in uh, ASEAN, uh, the ANZ FTA? Uh, you would uh, know that uh, I mean, the schedules are negotiated bilaterally uh, and, uh, somehow, and somehow it has to be, uh, negotiators were mindful that while there are some tariff lines that you can be, uh, you can easily open for uh, liberalization, say with China, it may be difficult to give that kind of treatment to India or to Japan or to uh, Korea. And uh, that's the reason why uh, the, somehow the structure of uh, ASEAN's uh, tariff liberalization compared with the ASEAN plus one FTAs has been like this. But uh, of, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the FTA has a, a review provision and nothing would actually stop anyone uh, from uh, accelerating or further liberalizing whatever they have committed to uh, in RCEP. Next slide, please. So when it comes to uh, services, uh, more than 100 uh, services sectors uh, will have their uh, restrictive and discriminatory measures are uh, removed. I think uh, this is already high, very high uh, compared to what has been uh, negotiated uh, in, or whatever has been committed in the ASEAN plus one FTAs, it may not be as high in terms of number of services sectors uh, that is in ASEAN's internal uh, uh, agreement on services, but in terms of the depth and breadth uh, of uh, the commitments, especially uh, across the, the modes of supply, uh, RCEP is much uh, deeper. Uh, the ASEAN FTAs, uh, in RCEP, there are seven countries who adopted the negative lease approach, while eight uh, of the signatory states will have their uh, transition to the negative list within specific number of uh, uh, years. Are you again to compare this with ASEAN's internal uh, work in, in RCEP? I mean, in uh, AFAS, 
you would note that in the other the ASEAN Framework Agreement on Services, uh, they have used the positive list approach for uh, negotiating the FTA, I mean, for making their specific uh, commitments. But under the ASEAN Trade in Services Agreement that has entered into force just recently, uh, there is a specific time frame uh, to uh, transpose uh, their services schedule to the negative list. But what we're saying here is under RCEP, for these uh, seven or for the, the ASEAN member states in those seven countries that have adopted the negative list approach, uh, they have even gone uh, ahead of what is provided for in, uh, in ASEAN. Next slide, please. Uh, I think I, I mentioned this uh, earlier, uh, but just to say that the coverage of uh, the MNP chapter uh, includes the business visitors and intercorporate trans transferees, uh, and as well as their spouses uh, for a short stay. And the commitment is to facilitate uh, their entry in uh, their uh, temporary entry and stay uh, of these uh, business people. Next slide, please. So uh, I think I've mentioned uh, this earlier, the four pillars uh, for uh, market access in investment. So uh, it covers four pillars. There is MFN treatment. Uh, there is standstill in a ratchet. But I think more importantly, uh, there is this what we call the investor aftercare, uh, where each, uh, can each uh, party to the RCEP agreement would ensure uh, that uh, the benefits uh, that uh, the, these investors who uh, put their investments in uh, the region by virtue of RCEP are really uh, taken care of. Next. Rules of origin. Uh, again, I mentioned earlier, uh, this is streamlined, the ROO in the ASEAN plus one FTAs. Uh, but maybe what we can emphasize here is that there are certain provisions uh, in the RCEP rules of origin that are not uh, in, in the ASEAN plus one FTAs, uh, not even not even in ASEAN's uh, own FTAs. Uh, and this includes enhanced rules on materials that are used in a production, especially for a non-originating materials that could be treated as originating. Uh, there is a, there are chemical reaction rules for it's just 78 tariff lines uh, that is to be applied as an alternative to RBC 40 or uh, that's regional value uh, value content of 40 percent or change in tariff heading. Uh, we have chemical reaction rules under the ANZ FTA, but you can only make use of this chemical reaction rule. Uh, if your particular commodity is not able to pass the RVC 40 or the CTH uh, uh, rules, that's the only time you can make use of chemical reaction. But under RCEP, you have a choice. At the outset, you can choose whether you want to use RVC 40 or CTH or chemical reaction. Uh, yeah, so basically, this makes it easier. Uh, for those who are in the chemical uh, industry or do, those who make use of chemicals in the production of goods that they uh, trade with in the region to really find uh, the most uh, convenient uh, rule that would enable them to enjoy tariff preferences under, under RCEP. And then there is also this declaration by approved exporters. In the earlier FTAs of ASEAN, only government, uh, only government uh, entities uh, are authorized to issue the certificates of origin that would be used as basis for claiming preferential tariff treatment. But under RCEP, if you are an approved exporter, you can, uh, you can just uh, declare origin uh, by, by yourself, of course, based on certain procedures, but you do not have to go through the tedious process of going to uh, the customs or the trade uh, ministries uh, in each of uh, in the exporting party in order to obtain uh, that piece of document that will be your proof 
uh, in claiming that your good is originating from that country or within the region. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, trade facilitation, I mentioned earlier uh, that we have advanced ruling on uh, a tariff classification, rules of origin and customs valuation. But more importantly, I guess, uh, for if you are an authorized operator, uh, you have additional uh, trade facilitation uh, measures. Uh, and then the risk management approach uh, for customs control and post clearance audits have also been a clearly, uh, I mean, carefully provided for uh, in, in, in the FTA. Now for non-tariff measures, non -tariff, addressing non-tariff measures, particularly the barrier effect that is caused or that is arising from the administration uh, and application of non-tariff measures has always been a challenging, especially for us uh, every time we uh, have consultations with the private sector, they always complain about the number of non-tariff measures that they encounter in trading in, in, in the region. So we were hoping that through RCEP, uh, we would be able to address this uh, primary concern of them. And we hope to do this by, uh, by putting in place a mechanism that would enable everyone to go through technical uh, consultations and measures, uh, which they consider to be adversely affecting trade. And this one they can do with, uh, within specific timelines. I mean, the agreement itself uh, contains specific timelines within these technical consultations uh, would be uh, undertaken. Uh, also, uh, we are not uh, touching on uh, the parties' rights and obligations regard relating to dispute settlement under the RCEP agreement and the WTO. Uh, if one party wants to bring another party to dispute settlement uh, because of uh, non I mean implementation of non-tariff measures, they can go to us, they can use RCEP, they can use the WTO. It really depends uh, on uh, their preference. And then the agreement also provides for specific annexes uh, although it is a part of the a work program, uh, it somehow ensures that uh, uh, those in uh, those working on specific sectors can uh, come together and discuss how to uh, address, uh, for instance, trade uh, technical barriers to trade, or if there are any uh, SPS affecting their sector, then they can come together and discuss how as a as a, as a group uh, address uh, the problems that they encounter uh, when it comes to NTMs. Next slide, please. Uh, I, I think I, I would skip uh, this slide, the next few slides because it is already too detailed on how we go about, uh, how we go about ensuring uh, transparency when it comes to uh, import licensing procedures. Uh, it, it, it is all uh, in uh, in this slide. I think this will be shared to everyone. Uh, so basically, RCEP is the first agreement where we have really uh, went to the nitty gritty uh, of, uh, uh, of providing for how a uh, transparency in the RCEP agreement with regard to import licensing procedures will uh, be pursued. Uh, we are cognizant uh, that the, the lack of transparency when applying import licensing procedures contribute a lot uh, in uh, making those, uh, I mean, causing the barrier effect of uh, those import licensing procedures. So while uh, this, uh, the ILPs, we call them, uh, is legitimate under the WTO and therefore everyone has the right to really apply import licensing procedures. We have to make sure uh, that the application of these procedures are not causing any barrier uh, to trade. Thus, uh, this is specific provisions on how to enhance a transparency in the application uh, of these uh, ILPs. Next. Uh, on standards and uh, technical regulations, I think what we just have to uh, underscore here again is uh, 
the obligation to uh, uh, cooperate uh, among the standardizing bodies in ASEAN uh, to ensure that the application of standards, setting of procedures, uh, and all those measures related to standards and technical regulations are not applied in a manner that would cause uh, uh, barriers to uh, trade. Uh, we also allow for uh, mutual recognition. I mean, there is an equivalence rule uh, wherein uh, uh, positive consideration to accepting as equivalent technical regulations of another country. Uh, even if uh, these are different from yours, uh, this should be uh, accepted uh, as your own uh, provided that it uh, satisfies uh, the regulations that those uh, that are intended to fulfill the objectives of uh, your own uh, regulations. And uh, if ever there are uh, in the event uh, that you are not recognizing or not applying equivalence to those technical regulations, the agreement provides for uh, includes provision for those importing countries to actually explain why they are not accepting as equivalent uh, those technical uh, regulations. Next slide, please. Uh, conformity assessment procedures, again, we would like to underline transparency and uh, for conformity assessment, I think we can uh, emphasize uh, mechanisms to facilitate the acceptance of the results of conformity assessment procedures. And uh, this could be done in uh, several ways, uh, including through mutual recognition uh, arrangements. Uh, there could be a voluntary arrangements between accreditation bodies in uh, each of the parties. Uh, they can also make use uh, of accreditation to qualify uh, those conformity assessment bodies including through relevant multilateral agreements, or you can designate a, con a conformity assessment body in another party uh, and, and so on uh, and so forth. Next slide, please. Uh, technical discussions, uh, basically this is provided for in uh, the struck up chapter. And as I explained earlier, when it comes to technical consultations, uh, it, it is only uh, an avenue uh, within which uh, parties can actually enter into consultations to understand uh, the application, why certain uh, uh, technical regulations are being um, uh, applied. Uh, and if possible, those countries who are uh, exporting or trading those pro products subject to technical regulations would be given the opportunity to uh, discuss with the exporting country uh, or yeah, uh, why those technical regulations are, are being applied uh, with a view to, again, uh, ensuring that uh, if possible, there can be some uh, mutual recognitions or automatic acceptance of the goods, even if they're subject to at certain technical regulations. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just for transparency again uh, the agreement uh, provides for very specific time frames uh, within which uh, uh, technical regulations and cost, uh, conformity assessment procedures uh, will be implemented even from the beginning if one party is considering to apply a technical regulation uh, there should be some pre-notification uh, it should be in english of course uh, they should be summarized and uh, it should allow uh, any interested party to uh, engage in uh, technical uh, discussions so that any concerns that they may have on the application of such a technical regulation should, should somehow or could somehow uh, be taken into account and factored in uh, when those uh, uh, technical regulations are issued and implemented. Next slide, please. Uh, the next few slides are going beyond uh, the market access already. Uh, these are the chapters that we said are not really in uh, the ASEAN plus one FTAs. Um, 
This is on intellectual property, uh, which covers patents, uh, trademarks, copyrights. But uh, beside other than that, it calls for mandatory accession to certain WIPO administered treaties. Uh, there is also technical technological protection measures and rights management information in copyrighted works. These are those uh, areas where we have gone a bit beyond what is provided for in TRIPS. Uh, there are provisions on geographical uh, indications. Uh, it allows for, uh, the agreement also allows for uh, electronic filing systems. Uh, there are provisions, there is a big chunk uh, of provisions on genetic resources, traditional knowledge, and uh, traditional cultural expressions, as well as uh, uh, enhanced intellectual property enforcement uh, provisions. Uh, for e-commerce, uh, we are putting in place the essential legal and regulatory environment uh, that, would, that we hope uh, would uh, create an environment conducive to promoting the growth of uh, e-commerce. Uh, there are also provisions on unsolicited commercial electronic messages, as well as the controversial customs duties for electronically transmitted goods is provided for in the e-commerce agreement. Uh, in a way, we can say that, uh, I mean, this is uh, when we mentioned earlier that we hope that RCEP would contribute to the multilateral uh, trading system. Uh, I guess electronic commerce would be one of them. Uh, because as you would know, under the WTO currently, uh, there is no uh, elect the, uh, WTO agreement on, on e-commerce. In fact, uh, these are still uh, being uh, negotiated by 80-something uh, member state, uh, members of the WTO based on what they call the JSI or Joint Statement Initiative or something like that. Next slide, please. So why is RCEP significant to ASEAN and, and the world? Uh, next slide, please. Again, we mentioned earlier that for ASEAN, it upheld ASEAN's response to the ASEAN plus three and plus six debate. And uh, it, it, we hope to show to the world and convince the world that RCEP is ASEAN-led and not China-led. We, uh, during the negotiations, we always get irritated when we read in the papers that as China led RCEP, China led this, China driven RCEP. RCEP is ASEAN led. And as I've uh, explained earlier, it even spans back from 2009 where all this process started. So again, RCEP is ASEAN led. Our, the conclusion and the signing of RCEP also validated ASEAN's capability to lead and drive. ASEAN centrality has always been questioned. Uh, there are a lot of uh, skeptics out there who from the very beginning uh, somehow said that, oh, uh, the RCEP negotiations is a very ambitious uh, undertaking. Can you imagine bringing together in one uh, negotiating room the likes of uh, India? when you have China there, and then uh, the geopolitics of uh, China, Japan, and, and, uh, and uh, Korea. But ASEAN was able to get past all those challenges. Uh, so uh, that validated ASEAN's capability to lead and drive uh, an agreement. Uh, it ha ASEAN has also uh, successfully provided the platform for bringing together RPCs despite uh, geopolitical uh, differences. Uh, before RCEP, China, Japan, and Korea, they don't have, except for China and Korea, they have a bilateral FTA, but China and Japan, Japan, Korea, China, Japan, they don't have an FTA between them. But through the RCEP, we have created, uh, they have created a de facto uh, FTA uh, among the three of them, even uh, the plus three, I mean, the China C CJK initiative, they call it, they have not really been successful in going beyond uh, discussing how to go about integrating other uh, economies. I explained earlier how RCEP changed the character of ASEAN's uh, FTA. Uh, also, I made mention uh, of uh, the, this demonstration 
of strong support to an open, inclusive, and rules-based multilateral trading system. I earlier talked about e-commerce, how in the WTO we do not have yet an e-commerce agreement, but also allow me to mention the investment agreement. Investment is also not yet covered in the WTO, uh, and yet in RCEP we have a very robust, uh, should I say, uh, in investment chapter. Uh, and, all we, and all this talk about keeping markets open, facilitating uh, the movement of, of goods and uh, services, especially those that are needed uh, to accelerate a post-pandemic recovery. Uh, we are all hoping that RCEP would also contribute uh, to such efforts. Next. Uh, transforming divergence to convergence. Uh, we mentioned earlier uh, I, I think I already mentioned that the RCEP goes beyond consolidating the plus one FTAs as we were able to uh, create a de facto FTA among these uh, CJK uh, countries. Next slide, please. Now, uh, negotiating uh, uh, a mega trade deal such as RCEP has not been uh, easy uh, for ASEAN to uh, lead and, and drive. Uh, and I have in this slide enumerated some of the challenges that we have encountered, uh, first and foremost of which is reconciling uh, the divergent positions among the 10 AMS, and then reconciling uh, the position of ASEAN versus the ASEAN uh, uh, FTA partners, uh, we call them. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, ASEAN is, is so diverse. Given the different levels of economic development, uh, their national interests, uh, their de development uh, agenda uh, are very different. So coming up with a unified ASEAN position uh, before facing the ASEAN FTA partners has been very challenging. Uh, and then achieving a comprehensive and balanced outcome among the 15 RPCs with a significant development gaps and divergent national interests and expectations uh, have also been uh, challenging. The lack of bilateral FTAs among uh, them uh, is also included in the challenges, especially when it comes to, uh, again, China and India. Ch India was with us all throughout until November, 2019. So all those uh, 30 something over uh, negotiating rounds has included at, uh, India. Uh, and India and China, they don't have an FTA with each other. India does not have an FTA with Australia and with New Zealand. So, uh, and then the, the CJK, I mentioned, they don't have FTAs uh, with each other. So addressing uh, their lack of, uh, the lack of bilateral agreements between these countries have been a major uh, hump that we have to really overcome in the course of the negotiations. But I guess uh, um, the most challenging of all them would be uh, the handling, how to handle the tendency uh, of those countries who are in TPP uh, to TPP nice, we call it TPP nice, the RCEP agreement to make the agreement more commercially meaningful, especially to those who are uh, in the CPTPP. Uh, we have how many of the ASEAN plus, uh, of the ASEAN FTA partners? We have Japan, Korea, uh, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand who are in the TPP. Then in ASEAN, we have Vietnam, Singapore, uh, Brunei, and, and Malaysia who are in the TPP. Uh, so they want, I mean, when they go into the negotiating table, their initial negotiating position would be what we have in the TPP, which makes it very uh, uh, difficult uh, because those who are not in the TPP cannot accept them. Uh, and I mean, they cannot accept them to be in the RCEP uh, agreement. Next. Uh, for the world, I think I've already uh, uh, mentioned this, but I think what I would like to underscore here is RCEP would be is uh, serving as a laboratory 
that would allow RPCs concerned to develop their confidence and capability to engage in discussions on new and emerging uh, issues at the, multi at the multilateral level. So I would again bring you back to investment, uh, electronic commerce, uh, maybe I could also make mention of competition, uh, micro, small, and medium industries, uh, enterprises are among those that are being pursued at the multilateral, multilateral level without much success, but we were able to manage them uh, within RCEP. Next. Uh, when will RCEP enter into force? Uh, as the 15 RCEP participating countries are targeting to have the agreement enter into force by 1 January 2022 or early 2022. But for that to happen, uh, we need at least six ASEAN member states and three ASEAN FTA partners to notify the depository, which is the ASEAN Secretariat, that they have ratified the agreement uh, 60 days. Uh, and then 60 days after receiving the night notification, then that is when the uh, FTA will, I mean, RCEP will enter into force. Next, what happened to India? India decided to uh, stay out of RCEP for uh, the meanwhile, and it was announced in December 2019, but we, uh, the, the 15 other countries still regard India as an original RCEP participating country, having been in the negotiations since its launch. Therefore, even if the agreement provides for 18 months after the entry into force of the agreement uh, for the agreement to be open to accession by anyone who's interested to join RCEP, RCEP would remain open to India anytime it wishes to join RCEP, uh, it is ready, I mean, uh, it, it can uh, join RCEP. Next. Uh, RCEP and ASEAN-Argentina trade relations, I think we have to uh, we have focused on Argentina, although we know that uh, Argentina is part of Mercosur. Uh, we should have made this an ASEAN Mercosur, perhaps. Uh, but uh, having said that, I guess we can uh, just uh, live with what ASEAN, how ASEAN is trading uh, with Argentina. Uh, but we are comparing it also with uh, Mercosur. Argentina is an ASEAN tra top trading partner from uh, Mercosur and one third of the total trade between ASEAN and Mercosur is actually accounted for by uh, our Argentina. Uh, and, and, the, and what you see in the screen that it has actually gone up uh, significantly from 2017 uh, to 2019, it went down to, uh, to 9.3% uh, in 2020. And this is primarily because of the COVID-19. In terms of balance of uh, trade, uh, it is in favor of Argentina as Argentina is exporting more to ASEAN, 30% uh, uh, more than, uh, a little more than 30% uh, than ASEAN exports to uh, Argentina. Next. Next. Uh, I mean, this slide just shows what we are uh, uh, exporting or trading with Argentina, but maybe ASEAN could consider ASEAN as its manufacturing hub uh, for cereals uh, for, uh, that is uh, transforming or mean manufacturing maize to corn flakes. And, uh, and then I've also for uh, leather, uh, I, I know Argentina is quite famous for its leather industry. Uh, perhaps you can uh, establish some manufacturing hubs uh, in, in ASEAN to ensure that uh, your uh, businesses also enjoy the benefits uh, from uh, RCEP. Next. So in conclusion, I only have this much to say. RCEP couldn't have come at a more opportune time given the unprecedented COVID-19 global pandemic. I think I have uh, uh, explained this a, a lot more earlier. RCEP is not replacing the ASEAN plus one FTAs, at least for now. Uh, the ASEAN plus one FTAs would continue to exist uh, alongside uh, RCEP, and this gives uh, traders in the region a choice as to which uh, 
as to which uh, FPA would be more beneficial to them, that is especially in terms of uh, uh, market access. Uh, for uh, India, despite the absence of India, and we hope its absence is only temporary, uh, the benefits accruing from RCEP are still significant enough to generate real welfare gains, attract investments, hopefully some of them will be coming from Argentina and from the Mercosur area, and open up market, uh, market and employment opportunities. Uh, the support from the private sector uh, is very critical to the successful implementation of RCEP. So even if the private sector is coming from elsewhere, if they see or if they think that uh, by adjusting some of uh, the things that we do in RCEP would benefit them, then we would always welcome uh, their inputs as well as their support. So come to ASEAN uh, to enjoy uh, 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 RCEP. I think that ends my presentation. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Anna very clear and very complete presentation. I think that it was very useful to know more about the disciplines that are included in the agreement and the relation between the agreement and the multilateral uh, trade and the impact also in, in, in this agreement with the uh, uh, internal process of, of ASEAN. As you said, it's very interesting to, to, to remember all the participants that uh, a recept is a, ASEAN lead that, that, that process, and that was very clear. So thank you very much. At the end, what we conclude is that uh, ASEAN members has a, a, a big market, a more big market with a RCEP uh, agreement. So that is important in, in, in terms of development. So thank you, Anna, very much. Uh, I want to remember all the participants that uh, you can send us questions uh, by the chat. So after, the space of our discussion we're going to have now, you can, we, can, we can read it to, to Anna or to all the panelists. Now, so I will open a, a space for a discussion. You know, we have three uh, participants, three speakers, Mariana Polisi, she's uh, the Commission of China Asian Affairs de la Red Argentina de Profesionales para la Política Exterior, Mohamed Nasir Mohamed Noor, he's the country head of Petronas, uh, Argentina, and uh, Rodolfo Cafaro Kramer, uh, that is the president of Mercosur ASEAN Chamber of Commerce. So now I give the floor to Mariana Polisi. Mariana, good morning. Go ahead. Uh, good morning to all. Thank you for having me, uh, for inviting me uh, in representation of Red Ape, uh, especially to you, Ignacio, and the rest of the academics, diplomats, ambassadors. Thank you. Uh, I will continue my uh, discussion in Spanish, if you don't mind. Um, bueno, eh, respecto a la, a la presentación de la directora Ana, eh, la verdad que fue muy extensa y quisiera discutir algunos puntos en particular. Eh, voy a tratar de ser breve. Respecto más que nada de, de, del contexto actual, eh, porque fue en realidad muy, muy extensiva su, su presentación, muy detallada, realmente muy, muy ilustrativa, eh, así que bueno, me voy a detener en algunos puntos que, que me interesaron y me, me interesan discutir. Eh, primero, eh, más que nada hablar un poco de, de, de los dos contextos que se presentan en, en esta oportunidad respecto de la, de, de la ratificación del acuerdo Recep eh, de noviembre de 2020, eh, por, por un lado, seguir problematizando un contexto de tensión comercial que eh, se viene dando, particularmente desde la crisis mundial capitalista del año 2008, en donde algunos autores eh, ven un creciente mundo de competencia bipolar, en donde la indiscutida hegemonía de antaño estadounidense no parece ser tan clara en la actualidad. Entonces desde esta crisis comercial parece que se ha catalizado, algunos autores como Joseph Nye eh, sostienen la tesis de eh, una profunda tensión comercial entre Estados Unidos y China, 
que eh, viene a catalizar un orden internacional en disputa que contribuye eh, en primer lugar a eh, un escenario de crisis multilateral, ¿no? con la, la avanzada de estos nuevos actores eh, del poder mundial. Eso por un lado, que es algo interesante que eh, mencionó en, en su exposición Ana y también eh, previamente Carola creo que también lo había comentado, eh, de, de, en cuanto ¿no? podemos afirmar actualmente de que el multilateralismo estaría en crisis, porque eh, en este contexto de incertidumbre eh, respecto de la pandemia, del COVID-19, eh, la celebración de este acuerdo, que es el más, más grande del mundo actualmente, eh, y que coincido también con las palabras de Ana, que eh, no está liderado por, por China, sino que es un papel preeminente de, de ASEAN, por supuesto. Vemos que eh, se observa principalmente que lo, el proceso de globalización, no podríamos decir que está eh, en grave crisis o que está terminado en absoluto, sino que eh, primordialmente podríamos eh, indicar que, que entraría en una nueva fase, porque se requiere más política, y los estados están llamados a, a, un, a un rol más protagónico, no, no solamente simplemente eh, regular el, el proceso financiero. Por otro lado, por mi formación internacionalista, quiero destacar que hay una competencia geopolítica a nivel global, y que esto se evidencia ¿no? con, con la firma de este, la ratificación de este mega acuerdo, eh, porque obviamente, como, como dije anteriormente, se evidencian dos polos. Quizás el polo occidental, eh, liderado por, por obviamente la, la vuelta al, multila, al multilateralismo, como le dicen algunos, con la asunción de, de Joe Biden, eh, la, la Unión Europea, enlazada a, 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 la, a la alianza transatlántica con Estados Unidos, y por el otro, eh, el... el el incremento de la actividad económica cada vez mayor, el volumen de interdependencia tanto del Asia-Pacífico como del sudeste asiático y eh, el Indo-Pacífico, a pesar de que, de que India eh, se retiró de, del RCEP. ¿no? Entonces, ante esta crisis inédita, de, eh, digamos, producida por, por la pandemia del COVID a nivel global, se requieren adoptar medidas extraordinarias. Entonces, eh, eh, en ese contexto tendríamos que que pensar la, la ratificación del acuerdo RCEP. Eh, algunas cifras que quería repasar eh, para más que nada seguir con la discusión y, y dar eh, la importancia que se merece al, al tratado firmado, que engloba 15 países con una población de más de 2.200 millones y un PBI que ascendería eh, a un 30% de, de lo, del Producto Bruto Interno Mundial, ¿no? eh, con un dos, dos, dos cien, do, do, perdón, 22 punto eh, 14 billones de dólares, ascendería la cifra aproximadamente, lo que representa un 20, 28% del comercio mundial. Entonces, en comparativa, también podemos pensar eh, que a su vez eh, el RCEP eh, es más grande, por ejemplo, que mucho más grande en volumen de operaciones y de importancia económica que el tratado, el nuevo tratado de, de América del Norte, eh, que fue, eh, digamos, rediseñado por la saliente administración de Donald Trump. Y a su vez, otra, otro gesto que, que, marca, que marcaría esta disputa con la, eh, economía, con la hegemonía estadounidense en cuanto a lo que es el multilateralismo mundial, eh, que también, por ejemplo, la, en su momento la, administra la administración de Barack Obama en el año 2017 había impulsado... Eh, que, que Estados Unidos sí o sí debía ingresar eh, en la ratificación del Tratado Transpacífico, del, T del TPP, que finalmente no se, no se logró, y bueno, eh, sí, este acuerdo de RCP, eh, RCP eh, que, que sorprende a la potencia del norte, de alguna manera. Eh, algunas ventajas que, que, que había mencionado Ana también en su presentación, eh, más que nada enfocándonos en, en Latinoamérica, 
eh, pensar que, por ejemplo, Argentina eh, es, como, como bien lo dijo ella en su disertación, eh, la principal, el principal socio comercial de, de ASEAN, eh, así que la, la tensión de la relación de, respecto de Argentina con los mercados que componen el acuerdo RECEP se, se enfoca principalmente en cuatro socios estratégicos que no los quiero dejar de mencionar, eh, Vietnam, Indonesia, Malasia, y por otro lado China. Eh, me detengo en China porque no, no olvidemos que eh, Argentina tiene eh, una relación estratégica, se, han firmado, se ha ratificado un acuerdo de vinculación estratégica, estratégica con la República Popular China, eh, entonces, no, no podemos dejar de, de mencionarlo. Eh, como decíamos, eh, la, el, el 30% de las exportaciones argentinas se eh, concentran en, en harina, eh, trigo, maíz. O sea, principalmente como proveedor, nuestro país como proveedor de, de commodities eh, y productos agrícolas y carnes y, por ejemplo, cueros. Es posible, también como mencionó en, en el como se mencionó en la disertación anterior, que entre Argentina y el resto de los socios eh, de nuestro país dentro del bloque regional con eh, Mercosur también impacte esta relación preferencial de nuestro país con estos mercados y empiece una mayor eh, competencia respecto de la situación actual o, o mercados potenciales. Y lo que yo quería también plantear es... Eh, Pensar, ¿no? El mundo post-COVID-19. Eh, eh, por un lado, es, tenemos este gran acuerdo de, de integración regional de, que viene de alguna manera a relanzar el, el multilateralismo a nivel internacional. Eh, pero también otras cosas que, que se pueden evidenciar eh, en este mundo en incertidumbre. Por un lado, un, más, un nuevo contrato social que puede implicar eh, una simetría entre diversas eh, regiones del mundo, eh, implicando un mayor desempleo, un aumento de deuda externa y un, un mayor control estatal. Por otro lado, eh, es sorprendentemente veloz eh, la catalización y la aceleración del cambio tecnológico, la expansión de Internet, la automatización y el impacto que tendrá a futuro, bueno, el 5G y, y lo que podemos pensar a, a futuro como 6G. Y eh, sin duda el reflejo de lo que será un mundo aparentemente más dinámico, donde las grandes potencias económicas eh, reducirán las vulnerabilidades del supply chain, de la cadena de valor en las próximas décadas, lo que también será clave para nuestra región de América Latina y para Argentina en particular. Gracias eh, Mariana por sus comentarios y por su internacional perspective about the agreement, You're really welcome. interesting. Uh, now is the space for Mohamed Nasir. Uh, Mohamed, are you there? Thanks for joining us. The floor is yours. Hi, hi. good morning and uh, buenos dias. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, RCEP uh, web seminar. Uh, to the organizer, uh, to the moderator, you, Professor, Uh, Excellency and Ben Seder of Indonesia and all distinguished guests. So it is my great pleasure on behalf of Petronas as a key industry players uh, to participate in this uh, very important uh, uh, seminar. So again, uh, I believe this uh, web seminar is, uh, is timely uh, and needed as just now I hear a lot of, uh, you know, from INA especially uh, talking a lot of uh, potential benefit that uh, it will create to the whole economic uh, of the countries uh, specifically and also to the global uh, generally. So I guess uh, in the overall context uh, and even uh, for Petronas uh, as a key industry players, when we look at the bigger picture, uh, our set uh, trade deal, we view this as a very key and it would definitely boost uh, the economic post-pandemic recovery crisis in the region. So we also see that 2021 is a very important year for all of us. So going forward, is, as it will set us up uh, for greater success for 2022 uh, onwards and beyond. So again, uh, this RCEP is very timely. As I hear from Anna just now, 
uh, it, it, RCIP and, and will enter into force in 2021. So based on uh, our data point, uh, the 15 senators of uh, RCEP have combined GDP of 26 trillion, or about 30% of global GDP. They also account for about 28% global economic output and have a collective population of 2.2 billion people. So this is huge to us. As all of us know that you know, uh, this agreement will help to reduce a tariff, uh, strengthen the supply chain, uh, and focus on e-commerce e by enhancing online consumers and personal protection measures as well as transparency. So I was made to understand also uh, a simplified uh, custom procedures are also set to be introduced uh, along with widespread uh, uh, paperless trading. So again, uh, this is very aligned to Petronas and very vital because we are also, as we said, as we speak now, we are embarking and progressing towards uh, digitalization in our business operation. Again, as I mentioned earlier, this is key for our economic recovery from the post-pandemic uh, COVID-19 crisis. Uh, just uh, give me, uh, you know, I just want to talk a bit in terms of uh, Petronas perspective. Uh, Petronas is an uh, institution or organization with uh, an integrated uh, business model. So we are currently present in the whole value chain of the business, of the trading, and in more than 40 countries globally. So that includes you know, our presence in Latin America, like Argentina uh, in this particular, uh, as well as you know, Brazil and Mexico and the rest. So just a little bit of uh, you know, focus on uh, RCEP. When we did our own analysis, the most uh, immediate impact of our set uh, could be the uh, regionalization of polymer trade within the region. So the RCEP is expected to increase uh, polymer trade among Asia Pacific based on our data point. Uh, in the 15 nations are gradually reduced over 10 to 20 years. So one bright spot in the gradual reduction of import tariff uh, for Northeast uh, Asia origin polymer uh, to southern region, Asian countries such as Thailand, Malaysia, the Philippines, and Indonesia from 5 to 10% to a maximum of 5% over 10, 20 years. So import tariff for polymers from all origin to Australia will also be reduced from 5% to 0% to zero in 20 years. So again, this is one of the key benefits that we uh, potentially see as far as the RCEP uh, agreement is concerned. So also the RSEP uh, will give producers like Petronas uh, kind of opportunities to sell our product at uh, preferential or zero uh, tariff, uh, not only in neighboring countries, but also in the country like uh, Japan, uh, South Korea, uh, Australia, and New Zealand. So uh, we also see that RSEP comes uh, in the right time because uh, probably you guys are aware that you know, Petronas uh, uh, in the final stage of completion, our uh, integrated uh, Pengarang refining and petrochemical product. So it's a 50-50 joint venture between uh, Malaysia, Petronas, and uh, Saudi Aramco. So we see that this is, uh, you know, especially on the polymers, uh, petrochemical business in our downstream sector will help uh, us uh, boosting our economies and add value further to our business. So if I were to relate this uh, with our investment uh, in Latin America, uh, for example, our investment now in Argentina, we're talking about even this year alone, uh, we bring along about tw over $200 million to, to our investment in the development and production of our uh, Waka Mata asset in the province of New Kent. Our product in this case is Medanito crude oil, which is currently sold uh, domestically and internationally. So with the global portfolio that Petronas has uh, in all integrated whole value chain, our view is that you know, such pre-trade deals, uh, in this case RCEP, will help us to boost our trade in the other region. And in return, uh, the way we see it, when we look into the global portfolio, in return, the investment and the value that we created through this RCEP can, uh, can be bring back to Argentina for us to continue growing our investment in the country. So again, uh, as I mentioned, the opportunities is huge. Uh, even in the longer term, uh, we believe with the right logistic and infrastructure, 
potentially, you know, the Benedetto oil, the product of Argentina, could physically or even virtually reach to the Southeast Asian region, uh, even to China and Japan. Hence, our aspiration is for the world to recognize the product of Argentina beyond uh, uh, agro-industrial that uh, Anna mentioned when we talk about the trade that we have, the bilateral trade that we have between the countries uh, with Argentina now. So again, uh, Mr. Moderator, before I, uh, I end my discussion, you know, we truly believe RCEP can be the catalyst uh, to create positive economic value uh, ecosystem uh, for all of us to work collaboratively to provide mutual benefit together going forward uh, for part of the economic recovery post pandemic uh, COVID-19 crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Mohamed. And I really agree with your final words. Uh, it's also very important for us to know more about uh, Petronas business in Latin America. So thank you very much for, for your opinion and your comment. Uh, now to close the space of discussion, I will give the floor to Rodolfo Cafaro Kramer. Rodolfo, are you there? It's nice to greet you. Yes, I am here. Gracias, eh, querido profesor. Eh, quiero agradecer al Comité ASEAN en Buenos Aires y permitir participar en este evento y felicitar a la embajadora Nini Kun Narjati en su calidad de presidente y, por supuesto, a felicitar a los expositores, este, la directora Anne Robin Noel de la Secretaría de la ASEAN y a la embajadora Carola Ramón Berjano de la Cancillería por las exposiciones clarísimas y al profesor Bartesagui que ha tomado el manejo excelente de la moderación de este evento. Siempre es difícil eh, ser el último que habla, así que voy a tratar de, de ser muy breve y tratar de decir algo que no se dijo o algo un poco más inteligente, que siempre es muy difícil al final. Eh, comparto, es una buena noticia para el multilateralismo lo que ha ocurrido con el RCP, sin duda lo es. Es decir, yo quiero ahí coincidir con embajadora Ninik, con, Bartes, con el profesor Bartesay, con Rabonoy, todos hemos coincidido de que esto se trata de una muy buena noticia. El profesor Bartesay, en uno de sus tantos trabajos, describió el efecto del RCP diciendo que era una bocanada de aire puro para el multilateralismo. Bueno, evidentemente esto es así, es una bocanada de aire puro. Y digo esto porque, bueno, hablando también, Mariana Polisi dijo que había algunos autores que decían que si, había, si estábamos al fin del multilateralismo o si estábamos en los principios eh, de otro sistema más individual y de soberanía. Yo recuerdo que Trump, cuando pregonaba la no necesidad de tener acuerdos con nadie porque Estados Unidos era absolutamente eh, autosuficiente, rompe con el TPP, pero rápidamente se apura a cerrar un nuevo acuerdo con México y Canadá. O sea que evidentemente los acuerdos son importantes, esto, esto, es, esto es sin duda. Ahora, en lo que me parece que, que esto agrega es otro componente muy importante. El RCP trae un componente de regionalismo y trae un componente de integración, que la SEAN ha trabajado mucho el componente de integración y supo cómo hacerlo y supo integrarse a pesar de todas sus diferencias económicas, religiosas y culturales. Y esto ha sido el centro del acuerdo y esto lo que trae definitivamente es certidumbre, certeza. Digo esto porque hoy estamos viviendo una de las disrupciones más importantes de la historia y nunca se golpeó con tanta fuerza la economía mundial. Y producto de ello es que nos encontramos inmersos en una gran incertidumbre y en una gran incerteza. Eh, y esto, el RCP, trae certidumbres. Y digo esto porque para los empresarios necesitan este elemento, que es certidumbre e información que lleva a la previsibilidad. Entonces, cuando los, cuando los empresarios necesitan tomar decisiones, ya sean comerciales o ya sea de inversión, esta es una muy buena noticia de que el RCP también trae un plano de certeza y de certidumbre. Además, apoyando 
lo que dijo la directora Robin Oil, esto bring together, cuando ella habla de, de que el RCB bring together, bueno, esto es muy importante porque hay un manejo también cuando, cuando, se, cuando se lleva a este, a, a este punto, hay un manejo del conflicto y del poder también en cuanto a RSP, es decir, todo está armoni, ar, armoniosamente manejado. Coincido otra vez con, con los participantes aquí sobre la centralidad de, de este acuerdo y que la centralidad nace a partir de la SEAN. Eh, la SEAN, como ustedes saben, forma un anillo virtuoso de crecimiento comercial y económico. Pero también reconoció la SEAN que están rodeados de grandes potencias como China, India, Japón, aunque India no haya entrado, como estábamos hablando, pero reconocen que en ese anillo central que la SEAN supo crear, está rodeado de grandes potencias. Entonces lo que ocurre con el RSP es que ese anillo se agranda y, y, y genera entonces un espacio de eh, más poderío económico y comercial en esa zona. ¿Qué impacto va a tener para nuestra región, para Argentina y para el Mercosur? ¿Es posible interactuar con las actuales condiciones donde no tenemos prácticamente acuerdos? Bueno, yo creo, yo creo que acá tenemos que trabajar mucho en, 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 en cerrar acuerdos con esta zona, eh, porque sin acuerdos vamos a quedar más afuera de los flujos comerciales, más afuera del flujo de inversión y de financiamiento internacional. Y además sin poder integrar las grandes cadenas de valor. Es decir, acá me parece que nosotros tenemos que tomar una, una, una decisión y tratar de llegar a cerrar acuerdos, pero para esto, claro, desde nuestro, desde nuestro aspecto, desde la, desde la Cámara Mercosur ASEAN, nosotros representamos los privados, y los privados solos no pueden hacer esto. Acá necesitamos a los estados que cierren los acuerdos y que esto le dé el marco al sector privado para poder mover el comercio. Esto es un doble trabajo que nosotros tenemos que hacer. Por un lado, eh, el sector privado tiene que hablar con el sector público, interactuar con el sector público para que el sector público avance con los acuerdos, porque por otro lado, fíjense, fíjense esto, ¿no? nos dicen que el sector público tiene, el sector privado tiene que ser más competitivo, pero nosotros para ser más competitivos también necesitamos los marcos de acuerdo, para que también este, tengamos las preferencias y podamos entrar a ese gran mercado que no tenemos ninguna duda que es el futuro. Para nosotros, y acá termino en cuanto a próximos pasos desde el sector privado. Concretamente dos pasos. Uno de ellos es interactuar más con el sector público para que el sector público comience y sienta la presión y la necesidad de avanzar en los acuerdos. Y esto, trabajo de can las cancillerías, hablo, hablo del Mercosur ya, no, no hablo solo de la Argentina, las cancillerías, los ministerios... Y, y todo aquel que esté relacionado para hacer mover los acuerdos internacionales. Eh, difundir esto que estamos haciendo ahora, porque es muy importante esto de la información, y dar, bajarle esta información a los eh, empresarios, y tener muy en cuenta, pero muy en cuenta, los beneficios que esta zona le da a los, a los empresarios. Y estoy hablando de beneficios en la inversión y en los beneficios en el comercio en la zona. Entonces, teniendo en claro esto, yo diría que hay que trabajar dos modelos claramente de asociación, joint venture y know-how, con el know-how que tiene cada uno de los países, y con un socio local en la zona, teniendo en claro cuáles son los beneficios, y comenzar a mover comercial y económicamente con inversiones las dos regiones. Ya sea inversiones de aquí para allá, 
y de allá para acá. En el entretiempo, esperamos que los estados se pongan de acuerdo. Y, pero en el entretiempo, hacemos estos pasos. Es decir, claramente los beneficios, le explicamos a los empresarios cuáles son los beneficios, y vamos a donde tengamos que ir para que los negocios y las empresas puedan crecer. Muchas gracias y seguimos para lo que necesiten. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Rodolfo, for your view and your practical uh, ideas about the, about the future, about the next steps we can, we must do it with the region. So thank you, Rodolfo. Now, uh, Anna, I have a few questions for you uh, before the final remarks of the event. Uh, at least three questions. We have five minutes, Anna. But uh, I want to start uh, to ask you um, the, your opinion about the possibility to incorporate new members to a RCEP agreement that are not part of the region. What do you think uh, about this? Uh. <laughs> I think that's basically the, the reason why we have an accession clause, although we still have to work on uh, the rules and procedures uh, for interested countries to accede uh, in, in, in RCEP, uh, I, I think we are not closing the door for any country who is not in the region to, ac uh, to accede to RCEP. So far, we have... Uh, Only Hong Kong has explicitly expressed its interest uh, to join RCEP, but there are also, I mean, we have read uh, somewhere that uh, there are countries like uh, Bangladesh, for instance, even uh, Iran is it, who are interested in RCEP. Uh, so uh, what I'm saying is there is no constraint as to the geographical uh, wherever a country is coming from, anyone who wants to join RCEP uh, will, can, can join RCEP provided that uh, it is able to uh, agree to the terms and conditions that the existing parties to the RCEP agreement uh, would be imposing su uh, subject to the terms and, I mean, uh, the rules and procedures uh, for accession that would be agreed upon uh, eventually. We have 18 months from entry into force to work on that. Okay, Anna, thank you. Uh, what, and what about India? You think that uh, India is going to join in the next years to the agreement? What is the position of ASEAN about this? Uh, India is considered an important uh, trading partner of uh, ASEAN. Uh, not only of ASEAN, but also Japan, Korea. I mean, it is very much integrated in the regional supply chain. Uh, in, in, in the region. It, it, uh, we feel sorry that India wasn't able to join RCEP because again, it is a very important part of the region. But uh, to be very frank, we don't see India, I mean, given the reasons that they have cited uh, before for not participating in uh, or joining in the final uh, stage of the RCEP negotiations, we, I mean, I personally do not see them joining Uh, even in the next uh, couple of uh, years. They have various uh, concerns regarding trade deficits. In fact, they're also complaining on the lack of benefits that they're getting from our bilateral FTAs that are being reviewed. So until and unless those uh, issues are concerned, plus it's issues, India's issues with China, uh, I, I don't think uh, we can see India in RCEP sooner than uh, we want. Okay. Yes, of course, I imagine. Uh, Anna, uh, what is the link between this agreement and the ASEAN economic community? Eh. ASEAN economic Because community. You, you, uh, yes. No, sorry, uh, go ASEAN ahead. Economic community, if you would look at the blueprints uh, that we have adapted uh, to establish the ASEAN economic community, the last pillar or the last characteristics a characteristic has always been uh, getting ASEAN to be a major player in the global uh, in the global market. So uh, it is uh, in this particular, I mean, that particular characteristic is the basis for ASEAN uh, exploring or getting into all these uh, free trade uh, agreements. 
uh, it wants to be a major player in uh, the global value chain uh, and it can only do so through FTAs. Uh, it, it, ASEAN is relatively small. If you look at, I mean, I mean, in, in so far as the markets are concerned, I mean, even if you take individual member states, uh, I mean, if you take into account member states individually, it is a relatively small market. And the production networks in, in ASEAN uh, are all related to the global uh, market. So we want to make use of the FTAs, the plus one FTAs as well as RCEP uh, to really integrate not only the big businesses, but more importantly, the small ones, uh, especially those who are uh, in the supporting industries. So we want to make use of RCEP to really bring our MSMEs into the mainstream of the global value chain. And okay. that is one of the major objectives of the ASEAN economic community. Okay, okay, great, Diana, thank you. Uh, finally, uh, the ASEAN trade uh, with uh, RCEP, it's uh, going to concentrate more with China or this instrument is very useful to diversify the relations uh, with other countries of the region? We actually want to diversify. That's why I mean, if, if it's only China we're interested in, we could have lived with uh, ASEAN uh, China uh, FTA. Uh, but we want to diversify. And, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have a lot of production networks in the region and they are coming mostly from uh, foreign direct investments, not only from China, but from EU, from the Americas, uh, from Japan, Korea. So we really thought that integrating, I mean, all, uh, all uh, the FTAs that we have in the region and not closing the door uh, of uh, RCEP, for instance, to only those who have originally signed for it, uh, it will expand our market, hopefully not only to those goods and services that are traditionally uh, exported, but I mean, we can even tap on or go into all, all those uh, uh, goods and services that are not uh, traditionally produced in ASEAN. We welcome foreign direct investments, technology transfer, to go into those areas that are that really, uh, I mean, going outside the comfort zone when it comes to trading goods and services in uh, from the region. Thank you, Anna. Thank you for these uh, answers and thank you for your clear presentation and for your time. Thank you very Muchas much. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Now, finally, I will I, I will uh, close with final uh, remarks about the about all the, the event uh, in Spanish, and then I will give the floor to Rudy of the embassy to close the event. Eh, bueno, yo creo, yo creo que lo decía, lo decía Rodolfo recién, ¿no? Esto claramente, lo que hemos conversado en el día de hoy y, y, y el poder discutir casi por dos horas sobre el RCEP es un gran avance, ya es un gran logro, porque definitivamente lo que está ocurriendo a nivel mundial eh, nos va a impactar muy fuertemente. Uno escucha esa sigla y cree que, que no tiene impacto en la región, pero sí tiene impacto en la región, porque estamos hablando de un porcentaje muy alto del comercio mundial, y estamos hablando de, 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 de que están mejorando las condiciones de acceso entre sus integrantes, y estamos hablando de productores de alimentos también, y de, export, y, y de, y de grandes eh, comercializadores de servicios. Por lo tanto... Eh, nos hemos dado cuenta eh, en el día de hoy que, que el RC tiene impactos multilaterales, sin lugar a dudas. Eh, se cierra en el momento justo cuando se necesitaba un respiro por el proteccionismo que había llevado adelante la administración de Trump. Entonces, el RC, sin lugar a dudas, dio un respiro, sigue las normas multilaterales. La ASEAN está cumpliendo un rol en ese sentido. Muchas potencias de la ASEAN están, eh, de cierta forma, eh, teniendo una transformación para ocupar un rol en la producción y en el comercio mundial. Entonces, no podemos no reaccionar frente a esto. Yo creo que el gran desafío de América Latina, ya no solo con el RCEP, con el TPP, pero con la posibilidad de que Europa y Estados Unidos se vuelvan a juntar en el transatlántico, con el acuerdo AFTA que se ha cerrado recientemente en África, nos está dando una señal clara. Estamos eh, yendo hacia un rumbo muy claro de mega bloques, de grandes acuerdos que ya no tienen que ver con aranceles, que como nos dijo Ana, tienen que ver con mucho más que eso. Eh, 
se discute si el RCEP es más o menos profundo que el TPP. Me parece que es una discusión totalmente irrelevante, porque ya el RCEP en sí, por su, por su profundidad, va a tener impactos muy fuertes en el comercio mundial y va a entrar en vigencia. Y allí están los 10 miembros de la ASEAN y además, por supuesto, las tres potencias asiáticas. Entonces, el desafío que tenemos por delante es cómo reacciona el Mercosur, cómo reacciona América Latina. No estamos reaccionando todos al mismo tiempo. Algunos países de América Latina tienen otras plataformas que los vinculan mayormente con Asia-Pacífico, pero el Mercosur todavía no. El Mercosur tiene un debe, me parecen, como bloque en una reacción frente a Asia-Pacífico, que es, les recuerdo, la zona del mundo que va a seguir explicando entre el 60 y el 70% del PIB mundial por los próximos 30 años. Y además, cualquier transformación que les venga en mente. Está liderando eh, muchos eh, sectores y por eso la, la competencia que se ha dado con las potencias centrales. Entonces, eh, como conclusión, eh, la importancia, por supuesto, de, de tratar eh, el RCEP, de conocerlo, de medir sus impactos, y de no creer que esto solo nos va a afectar porque Australia y Nueva Zelanda van a mejorar sus condiciones de acceso en los otros miembros del RCEP. No, tenemos, el, me parece, el error de creer que los únicos competidores de Mercosur en, 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 en Asia Pacífico y Oceanía son Australia y Nueva Zelanda. No, no. Nosotros competimos en esa región mucho más que con Australia y Nueva Zelanda, porque la industria de alimentos de Japón es muy importante, la de Corea es muy importante, la de China también, y las inversiones que se están haciendo en la ASEAN en este sentido son bien relevantes. Y ni hablar en esta nueva economía digital, donde, como decía Ana, el comercio electrónico es parte de las disposiciones del RCEP, y el comercio electrónico es parte de cómo opera el consumo en Asia-Pacífico. Así que son muchísimos los desafíos, por eso no puedo más que, que felicitar a la embajada, y ahora sí me paso eh, al, al inglés para, bueno, thank again to, to all the speakers and to, and to all the participants, and again I want to thank to the ambassador Ninek Kun Nariati for the invitation to be part, uh, to moderate this important event. And uh, now I will give the floor to Rudy to close the event with some words. Thank you very much for all. See you soon. Thank you, Ignacio. Thank you, thank you very much for your acceptance to be the moderator of this uh, very important seminar. And thank you also to our ambassador, Nini Kunariati, for having uh, held this uh, event. Also to Ambassador Carola Ramon Berjano, from the Minister of Foreign Affairs and all the, all the discussions, Mariana Polisi, Mohammed Nasir Mohammed, and Rodolfo Kramer. And we'd like to thank you very much. And for your information, if you uh, need um, the, I also, I'm, I'm so sorry, uh, Ms. Ana Robe Noel, uh, thank you very much for your cl very clear and uh, complete uh, presentations. Uh, for your information, if you need, um, a copy of the presentations of uh, Ms. Anna Rovenel. Uh, you can, uh, the ambassador Nimic has already sent it to the, to the chat group. And also for your information, if you need uh, the recording of this uh, seminar, we also have it and we can send it to you. So thank you very much again uh, for your participations. And in this uh, very cold morning in Buenos Aires, and we hope that um, Well, this uh, seminar can give us a very, very positive result to what we all want to do. So thank you very much again. Goodbye.